Time now for Iron Africa coming up. Tunisia's healing process, testimony from people who say they were tortured or abused under years of dictatorship, is broadcast on live television. That's where the DRC has a new prime minister, but the president looks set to stay on for another year, despite opposition claims his time in office is up. And a brighter future for some of the Nigerian schoolgirls who managed to escape Boko Haram as they take up university scholarships. Airing their demons in public, victims of murder, rape and torture in Tunisia are testifying on live television this Thursday as part of a process aimed at national reconciliation. Comes as the country continues to deal with the fallout from the 2011 protests, which ended with the ouster of authoritarian leader Zine El Abedin Ben Ali. But the remit of the Truth and Dignity Commission goes much further, right back to abuses committed during Tunisia's struggle for independence from France. Our correspondent Sandro Lutyens has details. Tonight we heard the first public hearings on the first floor of the building behind me. The location is symbolic. We are in the Elisa Club, a place that used to belong to the ruling family. But until tomorrow night, the victims have the floor, about 10 of them, all very heavy cases. And their names have been kept secret until the very last minute. They were gathering to protest. Then the security forces arrived and they started to shoot at them. The first bullet hit my son, and he died. The testimonies are broadcast live on public television. The main purpose of the hearings is to confront the crimes of the past and share the experience of the victims with the entire population. The main idea of these hearings is for Tunisia to be able to heal the wounds of the past, but also to be able to rebuild social cohesion. Nothing is better than a victim's story because it sheds light on important details that will allow everyone to have the missing pieces of the official story that we've always been told. Behind the public hearings, a massive effort is in progress. The number of plaintiffs is huge, but the political environment is rather hostile. Major figures of the old system obviously not keen on having people dig up their past. President Esipsi himself uh, has had an uneasy relationship with the commission, and the path uh, to reconciliation is therefore a rocky one. But these public hearings hold the hope of winning popular support and keeping the process going. The commission hopes to hold another session in December. I swear more than 70 people have been killed, dozens more injured in a road accident in Mozambique. That is, they apparently tried to siphon fuel from an overturned truck near the border with Malawi. The vehicle then exploded. The government saying it had been travelling to Malawi from the port city of Berea when the uh, accident occurred. Donors in Brussels today are pledging €2 million Euros in aid to one of the country's poorest nations, the Central African Republic. That's a little short of what the uh, government of uh, CAR uh, said it needed to help remedy years of instability, poverty and violence. The country was most recently plunged into chaos by intercommunal fighting, which sparked a French military intervention in 2013. Some 10,000 UN peacekeepers remain on the ground, but their presence has failed to prevent renewed clashes between rival militias. Democratic Republic of Congo next, where opposition lawmaker Sami Badibanga has been named as the country's prime minister. That is part of a deal which means President Joseph Kabila, who was due to step down next month, is now expected to stay in power until at least late 2017. So-called national dialogue aimed at diffusing political tensions over the president's tenure was boycotted by uh, large parts of the mainstream opposition. Our correspondent Thomas Nicolon has details. The news came as a surprise today in Kinshasa. Sami Badibanga was named prime minister by Joseph Kabila under a power-sharing rule that is set to maintain Joseph Kabila in power until April 2018. Sami Badibanga is a member of parliament. He is considered as part of the opposition, but he was excluded uh, from uh, the country's largest opposition party, the UDPS, in 2012. Now he is the new Prime Minister, and this decision triggered reactions in Kinshasa today. 
He excluded himself from our party in 2011 by violating the orders of party president Etienne Tshisekedi to boycott seats in parliament. He left. He's a member of parliament, but who does he refer to? He never sets foot on this property. He doesn't belong to this party. He could surprise us. He brings something new to the table. It's a bit of a change and it's not a bad thing. Let's wait and see. It would be wiser for the UDPS to wait before judging. He might be a great prime minister and the UDPS might benefit from this. Why protest when he hasn't done anything yet? One of Joseph Kabila's former allies, Vital Kamere, had been widely tipped for the post, but he said today that he respected the president's decision, although he could not guarantee yet that he would be part of the new government, a new government that will be facing a growing economic crisis, and Sami Badibanga will have to lead the Democratic Republic of Congo to a peaceful and democratic presidential election in April 2018. To drought hit Zimbabwe next, where scientists are conducting trials of new heat-tolerant varieties of maize. Comes to the COP22 summit, looks at the urgent need to counter climate change in Africa. Let's hope the hybrid seeds will be ready for sale ahead of the, planting, the uh, next planting season. Zimbabwean scientist Cosmos Magaragosho is breeding a new heat-tolerant variety of maize. In spite of high temperatures and low rainfall, the result of climate change and the El Nino phenomenon, this hybrid maize has managed to survive. The seeds are produced by cross-pollinating two lines, resulting in higher and later yields. Basically it means transferring genes from one plant to another type so that you create a new type that is the characteristic that you want. Once referred to as the breadbasket of Africa, Zimbabwe used to export maize. Now it imports about 2 million metric tons a year to feed itself. Earlier this year, Zimbabwe declared a state of disaster with two and a half million people in urgent need of food aid. But farmers testing this hybrid maize managed to get by. Compared to other seeds, these seeds survived the heat and dry conditions that we experienced and this resulted in a better harvest. I should have enough to last until February next year. Efforts to roll out the hybrid maize are being slowed down by government testing and approval procedures. Experts believe more should be done to speed up the process to prepare for even higher temperatures in the future. The recent research says that, that crops aren't keeping up with the pace of, of climate change and this is simply because uh, as the environment warms a crop will mature earlier than, than under the, the lower temperatures. When a crop matures earlier it, it gives you less yield. Drought is high on the agenda at the UN COP22 climate talks in Morocco. But while world leaders discuss how to cap global warming, farmers in southern Africa need to find ways to adapt to climate change in order to survive. In South Africa, another government minister is in potential legal hot water, this time over alleged involvement in illegal rhino poaching. Police say they're investigating after a TV documentary in which Guan Zhang Guang, a self-professed horn trader from China, said he was close to State Security Minister David uh, Malobo that even hosted him at his massage parlour. Pictures have since emerged of uh, Mr Malobo with uh, some of the venue's employees. Selling rhino horn is banned, but the animals face the threat of extinction due to poaching driven by demand in China and Vietnam. Malobo has denied all accusations of wrongdoing. Finally, to Nigeria, where some of the Chibok schoolgirls abducted by Boko Haram are eyeing a brighter future. 24 of the 57 girls who managed to escape the Islamist extremists back in 2014 are now taking classes at the country's American University, thanks to a scholarship scheme. The students at the American University of Nigeria in Yola have come a long way. They are among the 57 girls who two years ago jumped off the lorry used by Boko Haram to kidnap them. Now 24 of them are studying at this university in northeast Nigeria. In April 2014, Boko Haram abducted more than 270 schoolgirls. When they came, they were really very, very traumatized. So it took, took us some time you know, to get them settled down with all of the security that we have on campus. They actually came to realize that they, they were more safer here than anywhere they could be. The girls follow a special program before moving on to university studies. They say they can't stop thinking of those still held by Boko Haram. 
the rest that are not yet come, we are praying, we are still hope they will come back one day. And we want them to come here, we should study together. They all say they want to return to Chibok one day. After I have I finish with my studies, I will get back to Chibok and build hospital, treating people because we are having problem of doctors from our place. People are saying the study of doctor is so hard. Last month, Boko Haram released 21 more girls after the Red Cross and the Swiss government brokered a deal with the group. But some 200 students are still missing. So for Iron Africa, do stay with us here on Fosman. نقاش فرانس 24 جدل الان وحديث وتعليق من وفي كل مكان France 24 c'est une passerelle entre les cultures c'est la diversité It's also a great way of sharing it and discussing it on social media We give a voice to women and girls whoever they are wherever they are هل تعرفون باريس احقا تعرفونها تابعوا فرانس 24 لمعرفه الناس Tout ce que vous avez toujours voulu savoir sur l'Europe, c'est sur notre chaîne.